Thank you, Shubha, for being with us today. We're deeply interested in what you have. I found your talk fascinating, and I really wanted to share it with the Culture Circle, as well as members and students of New Acropolis, which I was telling you is a school of philosophy in the classical manner, which means we try to apply. So whatever you tell us today, we're going to try and reflect, how does that really apply to our lives? How does it change our perspective mm. on life a little bit? You know, then the purpose of this culture circle is to not culture for entertainment, but to find a deeper meaning, a philosophical view of culture, if you like, as a search mm. for truth, for beauty, for wisdom. And that's what we try to bring alive at our events. Shubha is a neuroscientist and the Dean of Graduate Studies at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which we all know and shorthand for, as TIFR in Bombay. It's a very beautiful space, which I've been to myself. And her research focuses on the development and evolution of the mammalian brain, okay, of the brain of mammals. Uh, she's extremely famous actually in the neuroscience world because she actually discovered, okay, Shubha, I have to say it, uh, that you discovered a gene that is very crucial to the proper formation of many very important parts of our brain, like the hippocampus and the amygdala and the co cortex. Um, and she won the Infosys, Infosys Prize in Life Sciences in 2014 for this. So congratulations, Shubha. Thank you for being with us. I think we're all really keen. What she's going to do is she is going to interact with us. She's going to have a very interactive session. And she's going to ask us very thought-provoking questions. And she's going to show us how our brain circuitry actually controls the way we experience the world using multiple pretty mind-blowing experiments. And what she also told me and she also says is that really where does the boundary lie between reality and illusion? I think this is as philosophers a deeply interesting question. And from our points of view also is that we need, we study these things in order to know ourselves better. And really as philosophers, what we're always seeking to do is to know ourselves better, all the various parts of ourselves better. Over to you, Shubha. Thank you so much, Zarina, and thank you all. As, as, as I was uh, you know, discussing with Zarina, my, my view on all of these uh, pursuits that we each undertake is I think that we are each in our own ways trying to ask who we are, you know, what are we doing here? What is, you know, why this, why this world? Why this being, why this, why is it like this? Uh, I think uh, artists try and explore this when they paint because they want to try and communicate their perspective of what they see. I think musicians try it with music because sometimes words aren't enough. Uh, I think dancers try and explore the, the experience of being in this way. I think uh, uh, certainly writers try and communicate and poets try and communicate it. And I think scientists do it as well. Science is right up there with all of these wonderfully creative professions, uh, exploring who we are, how we are, uh, possibly even why we are. Uh, so uh, that's, sort of, that's sort of my inspiration. And the path I chose is that of neuroscience. Uh, I chose this path because I was fascinated um, right from you know school with how is it that this amazing computer in our heads, uh, how is it that it allows us to feel, to think, to dream, to experience? And then as I, as I sort of grew, I began to ask, how does it allow ourselves to question ourselves? Okay, you know, our bodies are very complex. Our livers are complex. Our you know, hearts are complex. We couldn't do without any one of these things. Uh, but the brain particularly fascinates me because this is a complex structure that allows, you know, that somehow has generated the, the spirit to question itself. And that is what blows my mind. So what is it that I actually study? I study uh, what I, uh, you know, what, what can be beautifully called the circuits of sensation. All right, so this, this is every single nerve fiber inside our brains, okay? These are all the pathways. These are the, the cables that carry our thoughts, as it were. These are the cables that carry our imaginations, our dreams, okay? Um, in my research, I ask, 
how do these grow to be wired up? Okay. How do these grow? In neuroscience, there are two fantastic questions. One is how does the brain work? The other is how does it construct itself? And how it works is actually enabled and constrained and limited by how it grows. You can see it's a computer that you can't go and buy parts and you know hard disks and motherboards and you know RAM chips and whatnot and wire it up, right? You have to grow it. We all start from one cell and that one cell becomes many, many cells. And then some of those cells become brain cells and those brain cells go grow wires to connect up. So if those wires don't connect properly, the computer's not gonna work. And depending on how they connect, that's how we get all our abilities, all our sensations. So how it works is in fact, the, the fundamental question to how it works is how does it construct itself? How does it get built? That's the focus of my research. And I'm going to give you one glimpse of it towards the end of my talk. But first, let me motivate. Why is it important to even think about the circuits of sensation? Okay, we all feel, we all perceive. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a window into how these circuits actually enable and constrain, allow and enrich and yet limit what we think the world is. Okay, is seeing believing is seeing believing. These are beautiful flowers, gorgeous colors, right? I think most people would agree with me that the flower on the top is purple with white in the middle and then a yellow little uh, anther and the flower at the bottom is a beautiful yellow, okay? All right. That's because our visual system, our retina has abilities and those abilities and properties allow it to perceive only within a narrow band of visible light. Okay, there is a huge spectrum of wavelengths out there that we do not see in. And we do not see in them because we don't have the receptors for them. If, for example, instead of the Vibgyor range, V is for violet, if we went just a little bit this side of the V and image these flowers in ultraviolet, Okay, here is a picture of how they would look in ultraviolet light. Okay, so this is obviously not my work. I've credited John Roslett who uh, photographs things in ultraviolet light. Now, we can't see ultraviolet light. So this is, a, how do you say it? It's a false color to allow us to see how different this looks in ultraviolet light. And the point is that there are, uh, there are patterns in here. For example, this flower here looks plain yellow. But the plane, it looks like one color. Fact is there are patterns. There is a central pattern and then there is an, a surround peripheral pattern. Likewise here, there's a central pattern and a peripheral pattern. All of these look more like bullseyes, right? And now you think, what is the flower there for? It's not really there for you and me to have beautiful gardens, okay? It's actually there so that the insect gets attracted to it to pollinate. So you can see why having a bullseye pattern might be relevant to the insects and insects can see in ultraviolet light. So you see how the flower was constructed and for the insect circuitry, or rather, you know, it's a, it's a co-evolution. The, what the insect could see, those flowers got pollinated better. And so those flowers developed these patterns. What is, it depends on who's looking, okay? Not only does it depend on who's looking. Oh, well, and by the way, there are more insects in the world than us. So people who want to just say, well, there's, you know, majority wins. <laughs> we would lose out. And this is just ultraviolet, okay? In the spectrum, there is infrared on this side, okay, there's infrared, and there is bigger and bigger radiation. So scientists spend their time looking at large wavelength radiations, which just pass us by because we can't see them, in the microwave background, for example. And you can see the universe in X-ray at this end and microwave at that end. You can see the universe, you can see the world out there using wavelengths and equipment that can see them, and it looks completely different. Okay, and here we are happily thinking we know how the world is. So in some sense, my journey as a neuroscientist uh, very quickly becomes a journey in discovering your limitations. And uh, it's a humbling experience to realize that you're really studying only that which you can see and how science has sort of ballooned as a result of beginning to realize you can't see many things and then, well, what would happen if you could see them? So that's the sort of journey of scientific exploration, making wider and wider what is known, acknowledging always that you don't know what you don't know. 
Okay. So if what is is answered by depends on who's looking, well, is there such a thing as an absolute image? Okay, or is there context to everything? Okay. So here, for example, are two rectangles with two dots in the middle, two circles. And I think everybody would agree that there is an orangey rectangle on the one side with a brownie dot in the middle and a brownie rectangle on the other side with an orangey dot in the middle. Everyone okay with that? Okay. All right. Well, all I did was I simply took a square of this brown and I copied it over and over and over to build a bridge. And here you go. It's the same color. It's the same color. Okay, this circle here and this circle here is absolutely the same color, but because of the background, our eyes deceive us. And then the point in the visual system and perhaps in real life is that context is everything. So it depends on who's looking, but it also depends on the context. Uh, I can see wide smiles. So I guess these are things that, that you folks <laughs> debate, which I would love to hear about. Okay, now this is just, this is just color because it's, our world is rich with color and you know it's one of the easier sort of uh, experiences but uh, let's probe a little further okay let's probe some other modalities let's probe hearing do we hear with our ears okay this is a well known uh, 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 experiment uh, in sound perception for the McGurk effect and i'm going to now uh test you all i'm going to test your hearing okay this is a challenge tell me what you hear in this video ba 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 okay i hope everyone heard baby sounds ba 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 right all right you all passed now tell me what you hear for this one Ba 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 ba. Okay. I wonder how many of you heard a different soundtrack than the first one. Pa 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 ba ba ba. Something like that. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you could perceive the difference between these two? So it's going to knock your socks off when I tell you ba. that the two are actually the same soundtrack. It's the same soundtrack, but depending on which lip movements you're looking at. Okay, and to prove that to you, I'm going to play this third one, which is basically the two uh, videos next to each other. And I'm going to invite you to look at one face or look at the other face or actually close your eyes in the middle of it. Okay, and then you'll see what I mean. Ba 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 ba. You see how, depending on the lip movements we hear, the percept changes. No, what is what does this tell us? Okay, this tells us something about our brain circuitry. It tells us that look, our brains don't actually exist for us to know what is out there in its absolute truth, if such a thing is possible. Our brains exist to allow us to navigate the world. And in order to navigate the world, if somebody is saying something meaningful to you, you're going to be looking at them and you're going to be able to make their sound more clear if what you see feeds into what you hear. This is a useful life skill, right? So in a crowded room, you know, you're attending a party and there are two people having a conversation in that corner. And some, if you look at them, you can just focus and hear them better, right? So we use our visual system to clarify our sound experience. And that's what this experiment brings, us, brings out, right? So your percept of sound is basically guided by what you see. And that's in fact how ventriloquism works, right? If some puppet is moving its lips and a sound is coming in sync with what the lips are doing, you're going to transpose your percept to whatever is moving and that thing is going to be doing the speaking. Yeah, so ventriloquists speak until it's not moving at all. 
So if you don't hold all it, you think the sound is coming from somewhere else. Yeah? So you can fool your system. And you can fool your system because it was not, it was designed to overlay information from senses so that you can navigate the world. And it was designed to be of practical use. But none of this really speaks to what is actually out there then. It means that what your circuits bring to your brain, you perceive. And that's how you think what is out there. So you can claim that you heard a sound for sure, for sure, for sure. And, you know, depending on whether the visual was the same as the audio or not, you heard something different. And each of your experiences is as real as another person's, right? Bah, Let's switch to bah. touch. Okay. We explore the world with our hands. You can see children explore the world. In fact, as babies, you can see you explore the world not only with your hands, but with your mouth. <laughs> you want to eat everything. There's a reason, okay? Our fingers and our lips and mouth and so on are uh, areas of our body that have a very high resolution of touch perception, which I'm going to talk about. And yet, although they have a high resolution, the probes we have are as thick as our fingers. And this is how we can feel the world around. So I'm going to ask you to imagine a tennis net. Okay, here's one for you. You can now imagine this tennis net. And I'm going to ask you to do an experiment. Please close your, so, so take this probe, which is your finger, and close your eyes and poke at the tennis net. In your, you know, thought experiment, poke at it and answer the question, does this material have holes? I think most people would be able to tell me, yeah, the tennis net has holes, right? <laughs> your finger, your whole arm will go through the net. All right. Now, do the same experiment imagining a mosquito net. Close your eyes and you're poking with your finger. Heck, you're feeling the whole net with your, you know, exploratory devices and you're answering, does this material have holes? It's hard to perceive the holes, right? How many people can perceive the holes in a mosquito net? Impossible. Unless I gave you a better probe than a big fat finger, unless I gave you a toothpick. And if using the toothpick, you would be able to say, aha, the material has holes. So the point is, our world out there, okay, the world that we think we live in, we scale to our probes. Okay, we have material that we think is solid and doesn't have holes in it. Because if we can't see or feel the hole, then we're good, right? Finally, calm ki baat. If you can't see through it, then you can wear it and then it's not a see-through thing. So then you're fine. <laughs> However, does the material have holes? If an ant were to answer the question, a mosquito net would have holes. A mosquito net would be a horrible terrain for an ant to walk through, right? A bunch of tight ropes that it has to go on, otherwise it'll keep falling. If an ant walks on a carpet, it's going to be like this. You've seen these, these animations of these ant worlds, right? Movies where Disney, a huge, big, you know, trees where they're flapping around and all it is is blades of grass. So the point is, we see our world based on the scale of our sensory devices. If our sensory devices are fingers of width one centimeter each, we're not going to be able to perceive either very tiny things or for not very large things. Okay, very, very large things. The people who thought that the earth was flat were not fools. They were simply using sensory devices that were too small to perceive the curvature of the earth, right? If an ant were put on top of a, you know, giant humongo football, it's not going to uh, know or care that the football has a curvature because for the extent that it can perceive it, the football is flat. And that, those were the flat earthers, right? So our sensory devices are scaled so that we can exist in our little worlds. And yet, and yet, we try and not only explore, but we try and interpret and we try and define and we try and know the world. The first step in any of these is simply sort of acknowledging, well, you know, our knowledge is so limited by our sensory circuits because they are the resolution they are. We are utterly constrained by what's coming in. And how then can we try and know? So these are the sorts of um, um, thoughts and questions that I, as a neuroscientist, keep at the back of my mind, even as I explore, well, 
this circuitry that is constrained and giving us information, how is it then that our brains make such a rich world of it? Okay, our worlds don't have holes in them. Okay, in fact, I'm sorry, our worlds do have holes in them, but our brain does a great job of patching it up. Do you all know about the blind spot? Okay, our retina, our retina, uh, have neurons like this, you know, a, a, a high density, high pixel camera, and the nerves from these neurons all come out via the optic nerve and go into the brain, right? So where that nerve pokes through the retina and comes out, there is no, no light perception. So we have a blind spot. Okay, we have a blind spot in each eye. Now, how is it that we don't see, you know, holes in the world? It's because we move our eyes and we fill in the gaps and our brains construct a continuous picture. There are lovely experiments where if you're asked to look at a computer screen and the screen can track where your blind spot is, things will come in the blind spot and disappear and you won't even know. Okay, so we actually have blind spots in our world. Isn't neuroscience greatly metaphorical? <laughs> we have blind spots in the world that we work actively to fill in. We work actively to fill in so that so that we have a contiguous picture of the world that we can live in. Uh, to summarize everything I've said so far, our brains have a single point agenda. It is to communicate to us that all is well. Okay, you, you, you know the reference, right? There's a blind watchman uh, doing a tour at night. There's a watchman doing a tour at night shouting all is well, all is well. And this gives great comfort to the protagonist in this uh, movie, Three Idiots. Uh, when, after many, many years, the protagonist realizes that the watchman's blind is a bat. And yet, the R as well gave a sense of great calm. That is the job of our brains, to communicate that this is the world that you can exist in, you can navigate it. Okay? And then, we, you know, puny little humans try and question it with art, with music, with poetry, with literature, and with science. <laughs> okay? Such, 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 such are the challenges that we're dealing with. So, I study this circuitry that creates this gorgeous world for us. And as I set up in the beginning of my talk, brain function completely depends on the normal growth of this circuitry. So here then uh, are our studies and how the brain is built. Okay? Now, I wish that the brain were built like this. I wish you could hire construction crews and say, okay, you know, just insert a little bit of, um, you know, um, I don't know, empathy here, insert some logic modules here, and here insert a bright idea here. I wish it were like that, but you have to grow it. You have to grow it slowly and carefully. And here I'm going to show you how an entire human embryo grows in the womb. This is a cartoon. And next to it, how a fish embryo grows. Okay, so I'll show them to you one at a time. One cells become two, four, eight, 16 years, a ball of cells that's gonna become the entire fish, okay? While that ball of cells is paused, just waiting for us to catch up, here's the human. One cell has become two and four and eight and 16. It's a ball of cells and it now dies into the, placenta, the, the uterus wall to make a placenta nourishment. This blue little line is gonna actually become the embryo. And as you look, as you look, you can see a little uh, sort of uh, ladder-like um, um, structure forming. That's the beginnings of the spinal cord, okay, the vertebrae that are forming here. You can see little limbs here. And let's let the fish catch up. So this ball of cells soon spills over the yolk. It doesn't need a uterus and placenta. It has all its nourishment in the yolk. And before you know it, a long embryo is forming. And that embryo will develop a head here. And you can see the eye forming slowly. See that dimple there? That's like the giant eye. And see here the vertebral column developing, like I pointed out in the human. Yeah, the little choppy effect. Let's let the human catch up. And the fish is extending its tail. And here the human limbs are growing, the little eye of the human, the eye of the fish, the little limbs of the human. 
and each animal doing its thing, achieving perfection for what it is supposed to be. The human takes nine months to achieve this. The fish, these are hours, right? So in three short days, the fish is ready, okay, ready to literally escape and sort of say, hey, sayonara, out, yeah? So the time scale of development is different, but the point is because of evolution, the mechanisms that construct the body and construct the whole central nervous system are the same in vertebrates. And that's why we can study what we, how the brain grows using model uh, animals like fish or model mammals like the mouse. So my work is in the mouse. Here's a slice of a mouse brain. Okay, this is a live slice. Uh, this imaging uh, uh, movie is taken by a, a colleague in Japan, Kazunori Nakajima, who kindly permitted me to share this and use it in my public talks. Each little red squiggle is a neuron. It's a brain cell that's going to migrate in this slice and it knows where to go. So just as in the fish, all those cells were migrating and creating the whole body, here's how the brain cells are migrating in our brains as the brain gets constructed. Look at them, it's like traffic, right? It looks kind of crazy and chaotic, but the point is, if you imagine crazy chaotic traffic, as an overall view, it might look crazy. Yes, see it again. However, however, each little car knows what it's doing. Each car knows where it's going. So that's the magic of development. There is ordered chaos because the chaos is on a global scale, but each little structure knows what it's got to do, right? So how then are the sensory circuits formed? Okay, here is a cartoon of the human brain. That's the eye. And this entire thing is the visual pathway. Okay, here's a high man. This is a simplified version of the visual pathway. This is meant to terrify everybody. This is a simplified version. It looks like a complex train map of, you know, what the Mumbai Metro could look like or something or the London underground. This is the simplified version. All these nerves have to grow properly in order for the brain to do its thing and give us the percept of whatever the world is out there, or at least as we can see it. Okay. Now, here is a neuron, a single neuron. And this gives you a sense of the challenge of constructing this whole thing. Each little red dot on this neuron is where some other neuron has come and connected to it. Okay, Each red dot is a connection. And of course, this neuron has an output wire that goes and connects to other neurons. The brain has a hundred billion neurons and each of them make 1,000 to 10,000 connections. Okay, this is a nightmare. This is not a simplified view of anything. So this thing, fantastic as it is, is a challenge to study, right? Simplified, mostly complex. But what we have done now in this mouse section is that we have labeled the sensory pathway green. So instead of seeing all the pathways here, this, so here is where the sensory cells start and the wires come through this big cluster and they enter the cerebral cortex here, right? So my students, Ashwin and then Suranjana, uh, together with Tuli, who did her master's with me, uh, looked at how this sensory pathway grows in the mouse and what controls it. And they found something very interesting. Now, what gives us high resolution? What gives us high resolution? If we wanted to get a high-res picture, we would go out and, you know, get a bigger megapixel camera. Basically, the more pixels you devote to something, the better the resolution you have, right? Now, we have a limited brain capacity, right? Our CPU is limited. So what if, when you took in the sensory information from your body, okay, we'll talk about touch. If you wanted high resolution in your fingers, why give equal access for the whole body to the brain? Why do a one-to-one -one mapping? Instead, you could say, well, certain areas I want really high resolution. So let me give those nerves the best access to the cortex and allow the cortex to process signal there much better. Okay, so you can do this experiment and you can actually ask that, you know, you can get a friend uh, who you trust well enough to take two toothpicks and poke them on your finger at two different points, and you can ask what spacing can you detect as two, two, two pricks, okay? If you do it here, you're not going to be able to detect them as two until they are really far apart. But here you can detect them as two when they're very, very close together, fingertips. 
Okay. Um, on your lips, you can detect two very close points as distinct. That's resolution. That's resolution. And how is it achieved? Well, here's a picture of how our body would look in proportion to how much access uh, you know, it has to the brain in terms of uh, sensory processing. Okay, and you can see how the most of our sensory uh, processing, the CPU ability, the most pixels are given to the lips and the tongue and the mouth and to the hands, the four fingers, okay? Arms and so on, not so much. Trunk, not so much, right? So this is how our brain uses its limited resources carefully to give us the best resolution in some parts and not so much everywhere else where we don't need it. And this is the same thing for a mouse. This is a normal mouse. And this is a mouse mapped based on how much, how its body areas have access to the brain. And you can see for the mouse as well, the snout and the jaw and the forearms are important. And you can see this, what are these? These are whiskers, the mouse's whiskers. Each whisker is like a finger. And the mouse actually, so before a mouse goes through a small hole, it will whisk to sense whether the hole is big enough. When it sees a new object, it whisks around it. It's really like fingers. We're going to look at this whisker pathway to the brain. Yeah? Okay. Here now is a cartoon that shows this pathway that enters the brain. This is the same thing I showed you before, this green pathway that enters the brain. Uh, and now I'm going to tell you how we looked at this pathway in a mouse where a crucial gene had been knocked out. Okay. Now, what do I mean by knockout? Okay, so that's a mouse. This is the normal mouse brain. And now I'm looking at HIMAG, this green pathway. You can see each little blob represents a whisker. Right? So look at how much territory of the entire cortex, more than you know, a third of it is all devoted to the mouse's whiskers. And this is at IMAG. See each blob, each of them is devoted to a whisker. Each fine nerve is getting, uh, taking sensation from the whiskers and getting it into the cortex. Now, what is a gene knockout? Okay, um, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. Suppose you've never seen an alarm clock in your life before. You know, this grandmother alarm clock, ring that time. And one just landed in into your lap from the sky. And then you notice, okay, it has many gears in it. And you notice that it has an hour hand, and it has a minute hand, and it has a second hand. And you say, huh, these gears are moving and these hands are moving. I'm going to knock out one gear and see what it does. Okay, so that's like knocking out one gene. So you knock out the gear, and you notice that the hour hand is still moving, but the minute hand is stuck. So then you say, hmm, maybe this gear controlled in some way the moving of the minute hand. But this is a little simplistic in this analogy and in science, because you know, the second hand may also be stuck. And the second hand may in fact be stuck because it is linked to the movement of the minute hand, not directly to the gear. So you have to be careful when you interpret your experiments that the, the gene that you remove may control one thing directly and 10 other things indirectly. And other genes may also control. So there's interactions and networks. These are the kinds of experiments that we do. And these are the kinds of careful ana analyses and conclusions we make in order to uh, understand how does the sensory pathway grow. So I'm now going to show you what happens when we knock out one single gene that we hypothesized controls the growth of this pathway. And we're not going to knock it out in the very nerves that are growing. We've left those nerves normal. We have knocked it out in the territory that those nerves grow into. We have knocked it out in the cerebral cortex, not in the sensory pathway that comes in. Okay, one would think that if the nerves themselves are normal, pathway should grow normally. But it turns out that proper connectivity is a conversation between the pathway itself and the, you know, who it is connecting to. Okay, so communication being a two-way street. Here is the gene knockout brain. And you can see that this pathway, okay, this is this cluster of nerves that has come in and then that has branched out and formed these lovely little whisker clumps. You can see the pathway has come in, but the minute it hit this gene knockout cortex, okay, it seems to have trouble penetrating and innovating. Yeah. In this lower man view, very difficult to see these patches, right? Maybe there's one cluster here, but that's also not in the right place. So from these kinds of experiments, we can conclude that we found a genetic mechanism that's critical 
for the growth of the sensory pathway. And that this genetic mechanism operates here in the recipient territory, not in actually the nerves that are coming in. So we have some understanding of the mechanism, and now we're going to refine our studies further. Okay, to understand how does this normal pathway grow that brings us our rich sensory experience? How do the nerves that give a touch sensation, uh, how do they know to grow to the right part of the brain? And how do the nerves that connect from the eyes to the brain know to grow to the right part of the brain? And the ears, how are these modalities separated? Does this gene control the growth of all the modalities equally? These are the kinds of questions we are asking in the broad space of how is it that this magical, fascinating computer that gives us our experience of this magical, fascinating world out there, how is this computer constructed? That it gives us um, this rich world, which is almost inside our brains as much as, as it is outside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shubha. That was totally and absolutely fascinating.